Okay, to order. Uh, I'm Vice Chair Susan Rohan, sitting in for our Chair Diana Ruslan today. Uh, we'll begin with a flag salute. Supervisor Holmes, would you please lead us? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. If there are no edits to the minutes for our May 27th meeting, I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes. Okay, we have a motion. Is there a second? second. All right. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. We need roll call then. Baker? Yes. Crash? Holmes? Yes. Mayor? Yes. Is this? Is this the roll call to establish a quorum, or is this the roll call on the motion to establish a quorum? Yes. Correct. Yes. Then here. Renewal. I'm here. <laughs> so we, we just jump back up on the agenda to item B. Is that what I'm, I'm understanding? Oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Then, if then there. Then we have the motion. Yes. Right. Minutes. Okay. Thank you. So do we do we have a motion and a second on the minutes? Yeah. All right, then we need to do. Okay, roll call then. Yes. All right. We're yeah, like she's not got enough she's working on right now. You got thrown an abstention. <laughs> you figure that out, too. <laughs> Good. Lord. Yeah, rock my guy. What? Celia, do we have anything on the agenda for um, adjustment? Um, there is an item in, in front of you. It's not on the agenda, but it's an article from um, yesterday's Sacramento Bee that talks about uh, some of the uh, recent discussion at the state uh, about uh, any kind of capacity increases that is very concerning uh, in the um, California transportation plan, which is in draft form, uh, has language that says uh, to avoid any capacity, avoid funding any uh, capacity increases on state or local road system. Uh, we've already sent a, a letter saying that that was uh, not acceptable but in a much nicer phrasing than that. Uh, but I did want to point this out uh, to you as uh, some background on that uh, uh, issue. Okay, thank you. All right, we're on item E of our agenda. This is a time for public comment from anyone who wishes to address this board on an item on any of our agendas. Does anyone wish to speak? Seeing none, we'll close public comment. We're on item F, the consent calendar, which includes items 1 through 13. They'll be approved with one vote unless someone wants to remove an item for separate discussion. Is there anyone from the, any director want to remove anything? Anyone from the public? Okay, seeing none, that was a motion to approve. Is there a second? Okay, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Is there an opposed? Abstain. All right, motion passes. We're now going to adjourn as the Placer County Transportation Planning Agency and convene as the Western Placer Consolidated Transportation Services Agency. Item G on our agenda is consent items one through four intended to be passed with one vote unless someone wants to remove an item. Does the director want to remove an item? Anyone from the public? Is there a motion to approve? Is there a second? We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Is there anyone opposed or wishes to abstain? Okay, the motion passes. Let's move on to item eight on our agenda. This is the Western Placer Consolidated Transportation Services Agency fiscal year 2015-16 operating budget. Good morning, uh, directors. Uh, I will be handling this item. Uh, we're asking you to adopt the uh, Western Placer CTSA's 2015-16 agency budget. It's shown in the attachment one, which is on the flip side of the staff report. The um, proposed budget is consistent with the adopted short-range plan. All the programs shown on the budget are contained within the short-range plan. 
The um, attachment one shows that operating revenues basically have increased by about 12% over the prior fiscal year. This is primarily due to an increase in the local transportation fund apportionment as well as uh, carryover revenue from um, year 2014-15. The operating expenditures, they total about 1,567,000 rounded, about a 15% increase or about $200,000. And these are primarily directed to increasing the operating reserve as well as uh, expenditures that includes staff administration, the My Rides program, and tr various transit planning activities and the call center. And the call center funding uh, previously had not been included in the um, Western Placer CTSA budget. It was included as part of the overall local transportation fund apportionment as an unmet transit need. So it was taken off of the top of the apportionment. We're recommending that it be included in the CTSA budget because the call center activities primarily deal with Health Express and the dollar ride programs. And so it more aligns with this particular agency's mission. And so by doing so, you, you in, incur a $300,000 cost within this budget. But on the other hand, on the local transportation fund, uh, you have a savings or $300,000 that goes back into that fund and then can be used by the jurisdictions for various transit planning activities or if there are no unmet transit needs for streets and roads or bicycle pedestrian projects. So we kind of see it as a win-win in that regard. So we're making that recommendation um, there. At the year end, we're going to have slightly less than $90,000 uh, projected to be carried over into year 2016-17. Year uh, there is no uh, capital budget. Uh, all of the capital expenditures previously used Prop 1B money and those of all are either underway or completed projects. And I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thank you. Is there any request? Yes. Could you, um, and it's probably pretty obvious, but could you touch briefly on um, the 30% difference in the seniors' rides? between last year and this year? Right. The, um, the, the, we, we've seen an increase with respect to the, uh, the, the My Rides program. The My Rides program, briefly, is a volunteer rides program where we have vo volunteers, primarily re retired citizens, who help other retired citizens get to uh, various uh, activities, uh, medical as well as uh, various uh, essential need type activities. So the um, projection here uh, sh shows an increase because of the increase in rides. We, and our agreement, which you approved on the consent calendar, is capped at, a, at 125000 of that amount. We're showing the fully allocated cost here. And so it's incumbent upon seniors first to find the other fund sources. And they have projected uh, various fund sources there. But it's primarily due to an increase in the and the amount of rides that we're providing within um, urbanized Placer area. Plus, we've also extended the program further north into um, um, towards the Tahoe area. And so there have been increase in rides there, which is, is a good thing because if people had mentioned in previous unmet transit needs testimony that they needed such a program, and now we're starting to see the fruits of that. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, I'd like to open it up to the public. Does anyone from the public wish to address us on this item? Seeing none, we'll close public comment. Directors? Move approval. All right, we have a motion to approve the fiscal year budget. Second. Is there a second? We have a motion to second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Is there any opposed? Abstain? Okay, the motion passes. All right, we're now going to adjourn as the Western Placer Consolidated Transportation Services Agency and convene as the Placer County Transportation Planning Agency and move on to item I on our agenda. This is a presentation. It's the Sacramento Roseville Third Track Project. Um, yes, uh, Vice Chair Ohan, members of the board, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Jim Allison, who's the Director of Planning for the Capital Corridor Joint Powers Authority. 
He'll be doing a, a presentation on the Sacramento to Roseville third track project and just a little bit by way of background, since the first day Capital Corridor came to Placer County back in 1991, we've been trying to get more frequent service than the one round trip a day that we have going uh, through Placer County to Auburn with stops at, at Roseville and Rockland. And our latest effort is this third track project that would provide a separate passenger track between Sacramento and Roseville and also allow freight travel on that with UP's uh, uh, freight that they are, uh, they have their own bottleneck in that area and this seems to be a way that we can uh, work with UP and bring those trains to Placer County. We're now at a point where the environmental document is in a draft form and Jim Allison will be presenting uh, that to you. No, I, I think you're good to go. Uh, thank you for inviting me here for this uh, presentation, Madam Chair and uh, uh, the Chair uh, the, the Board. Uh, good to see some familiar faces, some of you have been or are already on the uh, Capital Quarter Board. So uh, we'll be touching this item in November for the Capital Quarter Board because that's when we hope we are hoping to adopt the EIR, the CEQA EIR portion of this document. So let me move into this. This is a presentation that we gave to um, stakeholders and it was kind of a precursor to what, exactly what Celia said. We're almost at the cusp of releasing a draft EIR and EA. So the purpose of the project was to um, not only preserve freight operations, which is very crucial for Union Pacific, but to obtain the capacity for us to operate up to 10 round trips as opposed to the one round trip that we have today. And we have always long time viewed this as an underserved market in terms of um, capital quarters potential and this, the concept of providing this level of service has been on the books, I think perhaps since 1996. So it's, it's been a little while, but uh, we're at the cusp of a next step here. So the more track will provide more connections, uh, should enhance quality of life, provide an, uh, an outlet valve for the congestion that uh, I saw in the morning coming up here on Highway 80 between Sacramento, but it's also going to be a benefit for those who travel beyond Sacramento and even Davis. It's a connection into sort of the California mega region into the Bay Area. So. Um, we feel that this also helps promote uh, sustainable economic development in uh, the Roseville area, but also elsewhere along the line. So it's a benefit for Northern California. It's a 17.8 mile corridor of the alignment in the Union Pacific right away. We are going to be looking at, a, we're looking at the alternative of the track on the north side of the alignment. Right now there are two main tracks more situated to the southern edge of the uh, Union Pacific alignment. This would be a third track on the northern alignment, leaving room for a fourth main track that Union Pacific might put in at one day in the future. There are 11 crossings of both waterways or um, highways or roads that we need to look at and build the structures for. Um, it will include new rail infrastructure, the ties, the switches, turnouts, et cetera, signals. I, at points, we have to put in crash walls. If, we're, if our track is going underneath a structure, we need to protect that structure and also the train from um, any accident that would be happening. It will involve utility relocation because there's a pipeline in the right-of-way. Um, and uh, it will also involve enhancing the Roseville station, essentially putting another platform in at Roseville plus also a storage track uh, or for layover facilities to store the trains overnight before they start out again the next morning. So there are 11 bridges. This is, might be a little difficult to see because it's in small print, but there are approximately 11 bridges. As I talked about, the main one is the crossing of the American River, and uh, that follows uh, that that's in an environmentally sensitive area, and we have Coast Guard looking at that because it's a navigable waterway, not for commercial traffic, but for uh, pass for um, uh, boats and such. The other creeks don't have that situation, but they do require a check-in with the Fish and Wildlife Service um, and at the state and the federal level. The Roseville project portion of this 
involves, as I said, another uh, station platform and involves also a layover facility. Let me see if I can hardly point to this area right here. Uh, the idea is that as after trains stop here before they, uh, they'll end their night here and they'll be stored just on that curve and uh, they'll get some light servicing, cleaning, and then they'll start out the next morning for that. The other aspect that this project has, um, which is a little complicated because Capital Quarter doesn't own any land. Um, we are working with the city of Roseville who owns and has a parking plan for downtown Roseville. So at some point in terms of the order of when things proceed, when our service proceeds, we're gonna need to work with uh, the city of Roseville to provide the projected parking needs to handle the additional traffic. This is the American River Bridge. Um, this is where the crossing would be. Um, we have coordinated with both the uh, Sacramento City staff and the Roseville City staff um, to look at, at this bridge impact. We've coordinated with Union Pacific for this and the station parking. But this, um, this is probably the most impactful portion of the project, um, at least in terms of the regulatory standpoint. The CEQA and NEPA processes are separated, but we're joining them together in one document. For the CEQA purposes, the California Environmental Quality Act is going to be um, satisfied by the Capital Quarter Joint Powers Authority. And then the NEPA lead, the National Environmental Policy Act, is the Federal Railroad Administration. Right now, we have circulated an, an administrative draft document to uh, various stakeholders, Union Pacific, but also the Federal Railroad Administration. They've had significant comments uh, to make the document look the way they're used to. So um, we're going through that process and um, it has adjusted our timeline a little bit. So we're a little tight on time and we don't wanna have any other disruptions. So, but we think we're gonna be on track for the November hearing at the Capital Quarter Board. The resource areas that we looked at cover the gamut of the usual impacts, um, the main ones being uh, the biological and the hydrology because of the, the bridges and those impacts. Uh, the other aspects are the air quality um, and transportation effects. Those are generally looked upon as a benefit because we are um, improving the general air quality in the area, but um, there are some regulations in the Placer area in terms of idling uh, diesel emissions that we are needing to mitigate just a little bit, but um, it looks like at this point for all the resource areas, we do not have any significant impacts and that's crucial for moving ahead uh, and that's what we would ask the board to adopt in the future. So all mitigations are less than significant and I mentioned the two um, main areas, the traffic. Um, one of them is the parking at the Roseville station. So. We're working with the city of Roseville on that, and then there's the biological and water resources. The general approach is to, when we're in construction, since this is a quite disturbed area, is that if we discover any critters or any bones or any artifacts that will stop construction, it's the usual response that you stop, you find out what's there, you deal with it at that time. But we do not expect anything like that. The other um, resources that we have, um, well, I mentioned air quality, that's gonna be a benefit. Uh, noise, um, we're trying to deal with that, but again, we're analyzing the effect of our project, not of the freight uh, railroad, which can increase their service. So um, a lot of the people will focus on the noise at the freight uh, operations, and that's not where we have to, uh, well, that's the one where the focus of the document is. Uh, the other impact is to the, um, American River Parkway, and thus far we've been working with the Friends of the American River Parkway and other interest groups there, and we haven't gotten a lot of comments or um, really uh, opposition uh, to this project in that, so that is, a, is good news. The project funding, uh, right now this is actually, a, this number that you see up here, 225 million, is probably low, <laughs> sorry to say. Um, we've uh, been working with the Union Pacific a bit more and also with the Sacramento County in terms of uh, crossing or Watt Avenue, um, we're probably gonna have to add a couple double digit more millions in there. It should be under, we're guessing probably at this point in time about 270 million due to those impacts uh, 
Watt Avenue being a severe step. So um, the amount of funds for this uh, are similar to what you might have for a, a highway on-ramp system. Uh, so it looked in that light, this provides a good permanent value, but um, the sources of funding that we have for the capital corridors projects and capital in general with inner city rail has been scarce, especially the last 10, 12 years. But there is cap and trade now, and we're working with the authors of legislation to modify the current legislation to allow for multi-year projects, and this project is certainly one of those that would fit in like that. Uh, there are some funds that are available and programmed from the high-speed rail bond, and there are some local funds that uh, Celia has uh, reserved for us. Uh, but we do have a big ask to get up the kind of funds that we need here. Here's the project, project schedule. Um, we uh, are a little behind on the dates from when this was published, but uh, again, the, the main target is the November approval of the EIR and EA. The Federal Railroad Administration will handle this project with their federal partners at their own speed, probably around the same time as um, the Capital Corridor Board will um, do that same or similar action for CEQA. So in September, uh, we would expect the public comment to close approximately on September 10th, leaving just enough time to respond to comments and get the item prepared for our board to take action. We will have public meetings on the draft environmental document that is scheduled potentially to be on the July 27th, 28th, or 29th. That's being worked out right now. Then there'll be a gap in time, and then we'll have a meeting um, around September 1st or so. Um, the meeting around September 1st will be in the Roseville area. The meeting in July will be in the Sacramento area. So there'll be, we'll hit the public comment period at the front end and at the back end. So if there's any questions or comments, uh, we do have a website. Um, it's going to be updated very shortly, and we're working on that update right now to answer some of the questions uh, that we would expect to have when the comment, uh, excuse me, when the draft period of review goes into effect. But I'd be happy to answer any questions um, at this point in time. So thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Directors, are there any questions? Yes. Just one question. So, um, and it's the obvious one, how much closer does this move it? Uh, us to possibly an additional train to Auburn and what, what, when and when might that happen if it clears the way for that? I know there's a domino effect that has to happen before that, but well, um, I've pet projects for a few years. Yeah, so. <laughs> unfortunately, um, this project doesn't directly relate to an additional train to Auburn. Um, that window we had with Union Pacific was a few years ago, and the state money was there, and the UP money was there until three days before. Yeah. And uh, that project is sort of still sitting out there, the potential's there, um, but we have not heard rumblings of it other than um, we do have an MOU with Union Pacific that um, mentions that project, but also the Sac Roseville project. Um, and when we talk with Union Pacific, they remind us about the Sac Roseville project. We have not had a good opportunity to remind them about that project, but uh, we will do. <laughs> when we can, as we can, um, but we would need a funding source for that. But when the Union Pacific wants to double track, finish the second main track notching of the tunnels, I think that will be an, a good opportunity for that. Any any guess on how far in the future that we might expect to, the door to open? <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have a reportable guess into the future onto that. Um, it will be a matter of circumstance uh, that you know, is either worked on I'm in I, I would After add, I'm gone, I suspect. well, I mean, <laughs> what, what we've seen and experienced with UP is they do things in their own time, in their own way, and they can change their mind rather quickly, as we saw in that three days before. And I will add, the source of money that we had to match their source of money is gone. So we'd have to find a new source to match that. Are there other comments or questions? Yes, Stan. Do you have any projections on what the uh, ridership might be once this project is put in place? Yes, we do. That um, ridership information um, from a model prediction right now is about an additional roughly 190000 per year to the um, service that we have today. 
generally those predictions have been slightly lower than what we actually get. So, um, but that they use a conservative approach. And this is to help relieve congestion on the Interstate 80. It, it does that, but it also is an option for folks who are traveling further onto uh, into the Bay Area and, and such like that. So we're going to be focusing the trains that we operate today that end in Sacramento or start in Sacramento. Instead of them starting or ending in Sacramento, they're going to be moved up to Roseville to start or end their service. So it's actually it's a relatively efficient move to just bring those existing train services, if you will, up the hill just a bit. Are there any other questions? Yes, Jim. Uh, thank you, Jim. I uh, appreciate you coming up here and giving us an uh, update. I appreciate the work that BCPPA is doing and with, along with the city of Roseville. Uh, this is a long-term project, but it's important for us to keep it on track. No pun intended. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, and keep us updated so yeah. we don't, so we know that we are moving, although glacially uh, we're moving forward. So thanks for bringing that up to us. My, my pleasure, and also um, we are planning a field trip for the Capital Corridor Board, those who want to attend, and we're going to be extending that invite oh, to PCTPA members, uh, Sacramento City Council and, and, and uh, county officials, as well as uh, City of Roseville officials. So uh, we'll look for that very shortly. It'll probably be about September 1st is what we're okay. aiming for. All right, thank you. Okay. Anything else? This is, was an informational item, so thank you very much for bringing that forward. And we'll go on to our next item, which is also a presentation. This is item J on our agenda, Transportation Funding Strategy Update. Um, yes, I'd like to introduce to you again uh, Jeff Flint uh, of FSB Core Strategies, who is our consultant on our funding strategy um, and will provide us an update on how we're doing on our outreach work plan and some tweaks as we or some the outlook and uh, any tweaks we're looking at moving forward thank you uh good morning uh i think you all know me but again i'm jeff flint fsb core strategies happy to be working with you all on this project um uh, as you may know, I think uh, maybe the executive director gave you an update on that. We did just recently complete uh, a new round of polling. This is not that presentation. Um, we're still analyzing uh, the data, and we have a full presentation of the polling results scheduled at your next board meeting, which I believe is in August because you are dark in July. Um, but we've we've had a um, peek at it, so without diving into those too much, because again, it's it very preliminary analysis. I want to talk about kind of the, the path that the polling numbers uh, on this project, and obviously we're talking about a potential transportation sales tax measure when I talk about polling and the numbers. Um, where those have been, what we've done in terms of outreach and education on this project, and kind of what the path forward looks like. So if you recall back to, at least on this latest effort, back to 2013, when, when the concept of a transportation sales tax in Placer County to relieve congestion generically was tested. It pulled in the in the mid to high 30s, which is not quite 67 um, percent. Over the course of the of the time uh, two years from since, in addition to a lot of outreach, we've done a lot of refining of the actual expenditure plan that would accompany any sales tax measure, uh, knowing from experience that. Voters are much more inclined to, to vote for funding specific transportation projects rather than voting for sort of the generic um, give us money and trust us to fix that traffic problem. And so as we've done that, as we've done a lot of outreach, as well as refined the expenditure plan and done a couple more rounds of polling, the numbers climbed through the mid-50s into the low 60s. Um, and depending on how you ask it, you know, we, we've sort of now um, uh, landed at that all you know 63 64 percent range on the polling um, again we need to much closer to 67 percent but still not at 67 percent um, and and again the folks from fm3 will give you a full deep dive on that in a couple of months um, but i want to i, I want to make sure that we understand that we've made a lot of progress on that but to be fair um, uh, it appears like in, in the context of w how we've been operating so far, which is a lot of stakeholder briefings, small group meetings, one-on-one -on -one presentations, uh, there is not a 
service club or chamber or organization that has more than 10 people that, that CLA has not taken the opportunity to speak to in the county. Um, uh, we've scheduled, I think, with the assistance of the members of the Board of Supervisors, just about all of the MACs in the county over the next few months now, and so appreciate all of your assistance in getting those set uh, as another level of outreach. But understanding that the, the, all of that's important, um, but it is, relatively speaking, to a county of, of almost half a million people, a relatively few number uh, of people. So we've accomplished probably two of our, our top line objectives when we launched this project. One is to bring a lot of clarity to an expenditure plan because we know that's what voters are ultimately willing to consider voting for. And number two is getting, a, I would say, a broad consensus from the opinion leaders, elected officials, key stakeholders in the county that this is important to look at for the economic future of the county, for quality of life for the residents. We really need to invest a lot more in transportation infrastructure than the, than the agency has available to it. But Again, understanding that we've sort of reached, you know, I don't want to prejudge that if we didn't continue on the path that we were on, that we wouldn't, you know, continue to move the numbers up a little bit. But we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people we need to talk to, and we've been talking to thousands of people. Um, so, so the next step, and it's really something that was always contemplated in the plan, and if anything, we've sort of achieved goals one and two, and don't go and look back at a plan and say that those are goals in one and two. I'm speaking kind of um, uh, vernacularly on that. We've achieved those, and so we're ready to move. That's not a word, Jim, for the record. I, it is now, though, because I've used it in a sentence. Um, uh, but um, uh, we've sort of achieved the initial goals, and so we're ready to move this next step, if anything, maybe a little bit further than, a little bit earlier than we originally anticipated, which is good news. Um, what that means is um, starting to communicate more broadly um, to the residents of the county with um, more forms of mass communication. Um, this would be still in the context of public education and public outreach. Uh, it would be uh, informing the voters of the county about the needs, the lack of funding, um, and, and what the funding options are available if uh, if there is a choice made to look at, at that option. What does that mean realistically? It may mean some, uh, uh, some public information mailers out to voters. It may mean um, broader um, uh, town hall meetings where we send an invitation out to, to large chunks of people and ask them to come into a presentation where we kind of walk them through what the transportation future of the county looks like with and without funding. Um, but, uh, and there's money in the budget for that. Um, as you all know, your, um, your staff and your executive director are um, iron-fisted on the budget. Um, <laughs> I get emails when I send uh, expense reimbursements in for $57.32. And I said, did you really spend that much money? It's true. Um, so so there, there's been money set aside for this. And, and we're really um, always contemplated, but we are um, looking at moving that up um, in part um, to see whether um, if we start to communicate with a broader section of the residents of the county informing them about the need, uh, whether or not then in subsequent rounds of polling the numbers continue to move up. And so that's, that's, kind, of, um, that's kind of the message that I wanted to, um, to give to you today. I'll add that um, in terms of outreach along with um, with uh, stakeholder groups and residents. There's been a lot of outreach to um, leaders in the private sector and the business community about, um, uh, you know, about their concern about this and, and, and how Placer County remains a viable place for them to make economic development investments based on whether or not their customers, their employees, um, goods and services that they utilize in the course of their business can rely on the transportation infrastructure to allow them to do, um, do their work. Um, we all know there's tons of evidence around the world and around the country and the state that um, businesses want to invest where, where the government agencies have made responsible investments in transportation infrastructure, and we see that all over the place. So those conversations have been uh, really positive, and though maybe out of the purview of what we're talking about today, I think it's appropriate to, to let you all know that uh, there is strong private sector interest in this, um, and we're hopeful that they'll um, conclude on their own that, um, that it's worth them, you know, putting some of their support behind that in terms of um, maybe some private sector public education as well 
uh, about the need for, for investment in the county's transportation infrastructure. So we're monitoring that and providing information to them and, and the feedback that we've gotten um, uh, has been really good. So with that, um, I think I'll just conclude there and obviously make myself available for any questions you all might have. Thank you. Are there questions? Tony. I think I got it this time, yeah. Uh, yes, I'm uh, at your next presentation, I guess, in August. I'd love to see more detail on how the, how the numbers you're putting together for positive responses are formed and the progression that you're just explained to us. We're at sort of 60-something is what I heard. I didn't hear exact numbers. I'd like to see how you're getting to those numbers. Sure. Uh, and, and it doesn't have to be multi-page great, great detail, just enough so that we can get a feel of how that's really going. Sure. We'll definitely be able to do that. We've seen a, a very early draft of what that presentation might look like from the pollster. And again, I don't want to steal their thunder, uh, and they have a lot of work to do to analyze it and, and pour over the numbers with, uh, with me and Celia and to ready for that presentation. But broadly speaking, when I say um, ish, it's because we do different things in the course of conducting the poll to test how people might react to if the ballot question were worded this way, if they um, are or are not aware that there may be a lot of other tax measures on the ballot from the state and how that impacts their thinking about then whether or not they're more or less willing to vote for a local tax measure if they've gotten to that on their ballot after they've seen six attempts by various um, interest groups at the state level to raise taxes. I, I can tell I think I've talked about this before. When we dealt with that on the Measure M campaign in Orange County, we actually that actually ended up ultimately driving more support for the local measure because folks saying, I don't want any of those state tax increases, but I'm willing to vote for a tax that's raised locally and stays locally. So so when I say it's not a precise number, it's because we we actually over the course of the survey asked people whether or not they're willing to support this four different ways to test some different theories and different impacts of the environment. And, and then we sort of amalgamate that into our, you know, uh, we're in that kind of 63, 64% range. Yeah. Keith. Um, and, and following along with, the, with and, I, and I'm remiss on the number of the bill, but uh, trying to put the initiative on the ballot to reduce that threshold to 55%, it seems like we're, we're hovering at that 62, 63, 64%. We're not quite at that 66%. So it seems to me it would behoove us to, to take a lot of those efforts and maybe push to support that, that lower threshold um, in kind of in tangentially along with this. So what, what's the latest updates on that, or, or, or where is that at this point? Do we have any idea? I, I have not heard that. You know, we sent the letter of support right. because the board <clears throat> voted uh, last month to support that. Um, I have not heard that it has moved, but I need to check back on that. I, I have heard anecdotally that it's a really heavy lift right. in, in terms of this environment to get that change, but there are um, some heavy hitters behind it, you know, in terms of the Assembly Transportation Committee chair is the one who sponsored the bill, but with some of the other bills that are going on, uh, specifically SB 16, which the board <laughs> also voted uh, support if amended, um, that is moving forward. And actually, maybe we're kind of going into what I was going to go into on my executive director's report, is the governor announced a, a special session on Medi-Cal, which is one subject, but then on transportation. And SB 16 is being reformulated along with a, a bill by Senator Huff which provides the safeguards for that additional revenue that would go to road rehabilitation that the state wants to do, the SB 16, to put that uh, together. So some of the if amendment part, if amended part of what we were asking for seems to be happening. Now whether the issue of the threshold is also going to be on the table here, that's yet to be seen. I just I feel like we're we're hovering at that 62 to 64 percent. We're going to spend, and and I understand I appreciate it. We're going to spend a lot of our time hovering one percent below where we need to be when maybe we should take some of our efforts and reduce that threshold. So we're already we're sort of already in that area. So just whatever we can do to support that and and push on that, I think is is just as important as as these polling numbers. Sure. 
Are there any other comments or questions? This was an informational item. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Okay. We'll move on to item K. This is a public hearing on I-80 State Route 65 interchange improvements. Uh, good morning, Vice Chair and members of the board. I'm going to be giving an update on the Interstate 80 State Route 65 interchange. Uh, we did release a public notice for a public hearing, and um, I'm going to be getting into a little bit of detail about that. But first, uh, this project is a top priority of the PCTPA board, and the staff here has been working aggressively towards completion of the environmental document. And as I mentioned, we released a public notice um, for a public hearing today, but we were anticipating to release the draft environmental document before this meeting. And we're currently waiting just on one last item, and that's a concurrence letter from the State Historic Preservation Officer. And once we receive that concurrence letter, we plan to release the draft environmental document in July, and then we'll be come back in August to hold the public uh, meeting on the draft environmental document. The good news in all of this is that we're still moving forward on all fronts, and we still anticipate to have final approval of the environmental document in spring of 2017, and then move forward with design and construction. 2016. 2016, sorry. Spring of 2016 for a final adoption. Don't freak out anymore. I'm already, think, I'm already thinking about construction in 2017. Uh, so uh, what we're asking the board to do is to open the public hearing. Uh, if there are any comments, uh, we can take those now and then continue the uh, public hearing until August. And then after this item, uh, we do have an update on the funding of the first phase. Um, and th this is where I take over is the, the money. Um, and the other item before the board for action is to authorize uh, me to negotiate and sign a cooperative agreement with Caltrans to um, uh, move forward on phase 1A of the 8065 interchange at an amount not to exceed 11 $0.25 million. And if you recall back in, last December, uh, the board approved a game plan on this uh, smaller first phase, which is to widen the viaduct section that is over the top of the interchange where you have the merge movements from the loop as well as the westbound to northbound. This would widen that so that there are no merge movements there, that they have a, a full three lanes of width. And since then, we have also added uh, the work on the Galleria interchange with the um, Highway 65 JPA is going to fund. That is part of their fee program. By doing this all at once, it makes a huge amount of sense for the traveling public, first of all, but it also saves money, um, which is, is a terrific thing. Uh, since that time, we have been working with Caltrans, moving forward on the project, and we now have an estimate of about $33 million for this. We have very limited funds, as you well know, and we are working on a backup plan. We have our primary plan on our funding, which would be as part of a transportation sales tax, but we don't know whether that's going to happen and won't know until just before this project is going to be ready for construction. So the cooperative agreement would be based on that backup plan, which includes uh, savings from our federal earmark that uh, funded the I-80 bottleneck, as well as funding from the South Placer Regional Transportation Authority, or SPARTA, those developer impact funds, and that we can we can pull together that $11.25 million that would be the basis of that cooperative agreement. The good news is when we had come to you in December, it was a 50-50 deal because our funds are limited. Caltrans has really stepped up on this, and now it is a 65-35 deal. So our 35% of the money is leveraging even more, which I, I have to give uh, a lot of compliments to Caltrans. I see uh, Wayne Lewis is in the audience here, who is the project manager for Caltrans, as well as a Roseville resident, um, as, as well as the uh, new Caltrans district director, Amarjeet Benapal. He's been uh, really pushing forward on this as hard as we have, so that kind of partnership gets projects done. 
So with that, uh, staff is, is requesting that you authorize me to sign this cooperative agreement. Should a transportation sales tax happen, then we would amend that cooperative agreement to change the source of money appropriately. All right. Directors, are there any questions of staff before I open this up to the public? All right. Seeing no questions, I'd like to, to first open up the uh, public hearing on the environmental document. Anyone wish to address this? All right, we'll continue public comment until August 26th. And then I would like to open it up to the public for any comment on the proposal to sign the cooperative agreement. Seeing no comment, um, is there any discussion on the part of the board or entertain a motion to approve? I just have a one clarifying question. Yes. So, we are not today able to distribute our draft of the environmental document because we are waiting on the state historic preservation officer to analyze the impacts of our project on Sutter's Fort, <laughs> one of our missions. There's actually three cultural sites. There's one under the viaduct that has to do with the tribe, and then there's also a Native American site um, and there's also a uh, historic stone house in Roseville, and then there's also the Transcontinental Railroad. There's three items that we're trying to get concurrence on, on their eligibility or non-eligibility, and we need that concurrence letter before we can release the draft environmental document. Have we been given any expectation as to, because none of those three are new from the original <laughs> project that's in the ground today? All three of those were impacts that had to be analyzed when the project that's in the ground today, the existing Highway 65 interchange, went into place. That stone house was there. The Native American site was there. The Transcontinental Railroad was there. Yeah, so uh, Caltrans has actually been a great partner in this. They, they validated this project to the number one in the state. They actually have a liaison at, the sh at SHPO. Um, and they are currently working on that very actively and aggressively, and, and we anticipate a letter within the next week or two. Um, so we do anticipate we will be able to circulate. It was, it's kind of unfortunate timing, uh, the way everything worked out. All right. I, I will add that the rules have changed somewhat since the 80s when the original structure was built and the way they look at things has changed. I, I completely agree with you that, you know, it's... It's challenging to work through these, but these are the hoops you have to jump through whether you like them or not. I understand. Thank you. All right. Uh, with that question answered, is there a motion to approve? Okay, we have a motion. Is there a second? All right, we have a motion and a second. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Is there any opposition or abstain? Okay, motion passes. We'll go on to item L on our agenda. This is Coalition for Infrastructure Earmarks. Celia? Yes. Uh, this item is to ask the board if uh, we would like to become an inaugural member of the Coalition for Infrastructure Earmarks. And a little bit of background. Earmarking has really gotten a bad name. And I don't think it's uh, by any means Placer's fault because we've done some great things with earmarks. Uh, the funding for most of the I-80 bottleneck came from a large federal earmark that Congressman Doolittle uh, secured for us back in 2005. We received earmarks for the Lincoln Bypass that were critical, and that earmark for the bottleneck has actually, the savings from that, after we leveraged some state dollars, paid for improvements to the I-80 Eureka Road interchange and are providing a lot of the seed money that we're using for the I-8065 interchange. Um, unfortunately, there, are, uh, there was a big controversy. I think it was focused on a, a bridge to nowhere in Alaska that um, ended up being defunded uh, at the end of the day. But since 2011, uh, earmarks have been banned. And the, the challenge is, is that it's not really saved any money. What's happened is that the money that used to be earmarked is now being distributed by federal agencies, and those are not done with federal law or voted on by Congress. Those are un all done by bureaucrats, um, and it, it makes it more challenging to daylight these, these kind of projects. And 
there is a, a group of folks that are interested in bringing back earmarks and being able to daylight those kinds of proposals and the dollar amounts and where they're going and justifying them um, that uh, is being organized by our federal advocate, uh, Sandy Esposito, and we've been invited to be an inaugural member. I think not only because of, of the good use that we have made of earmarks, we're, we're a great example for that, and we could do a lot more if we were able to compete for those dollars for things like the 8065 interchange as well as the, the Placer Parkway. Um, so uh, staff is, is um, requesting that the board uh, approve this uh, joining this uh, membership. And, and I will add that uh, because we are currently clients of uh, uh, the federal advocates group, we would not uh, have to pay anything to become a member. All right, thank you for the staff report. Board members, are there any questions? Oh, I just want to make a comment. I think this is a very good idea. I remember talking to a former congressman about this whole issue with the earmarks, and he said, when you have an earmark, you actually know where the money's going and what it's for. But it got blown up uh, with uh, the senator from Alaska and his bridge to nowhere, which, again, was defunded, but everybody got wound up and excited about earmarks. It's going to break us, and it was not the case. So anyhow, I, I would support uh, becoming a inaugural member. Are there any other questions before I open it up to the public? I don't have a question, but just um, I am in favor of us engaging in this conversation, but I think it would be smart for this group to recognize that we have lost the battle of language around the use of the word earmarks. And we will spend way too much time as an organization trying to explain why earmarks aren't bad as opposed to simply redefining the conversation. This is congressionally directed infrastructure spending. These are not earmarks. These are members of Congress saying these projects are important for our regional infrastructure needs, for our national security needs, whatever they are. And so a, a coalition for infrastructure earmarks, I think, is going to be too distracted on trying to redefine why earmarks aren't bad as opposed to simply saying, do you support your member of Congress being able to identify a project that's important in his or her district and fight to allocate funds and explain to his colleagues, 435 other folks, why this is important and why it's worthy of funds? Do you support that? And I'm willing to bet you the vast majority of people would say, yeah, that's, isn't that what they do? Isn't that what they're there for? And isn't that why they have oversight committees to make sure why we don't get bridges to nowhere? Isn't that what oversight committees are supposed to do? So you mean our members of Congress weren't doing their job when, when this bridge to nowhere got approved in the first place and then the oversight committee didn't do its job to make sure? If you ask the question, do you support Congress, who has the power of the purse constitutionally, saying where the money should be spent, people say yeah. Do you support earmarks? People say no. So let's not spend the time and the effort trying to win back the use of the word. Let's just call it something else, congressionally directed infrastructure spending. That's first and foremost. This is a gift from God when it comes to this conversation that we're having today because by Congress completely abrogating its responsibility in directing spending, and having, handing it over to not just unelected folks, but an entirely different branch of government. When you hand it back to the agencies, you're handing your congressional, your constitutionally, congressionally directed authority to spend money back to the executive branch. And they get a say where the money's gonna go. And all too often, as this illustrates, it's based on somebody else's idea of what's better for me in Granite Bay or Roseville than it is what those of us that are paying for it think meets our needs. And so utilizing examples like this, where 
social engineering is the priority, not getting people out of gridlock traffic is the priority. These kinds of examples need to be utilized. So I very strongly support us engaging this conversation, but I don't want to start out with, you know, two strikes against us by how we define the debate. All right. Are there any other um, comments? I would prefer to keep comments after we've opened it to the public, but we've already had two. <laughs> All right, then uh, I'm going to open this to the public. Does anyone wish to address this body on this matter before we continue our discussion? Okay, seeing none. Um, are there any other board members who would like to provide any comment on the table? I just have a question, and mm -hmm. that is uh, once the board affirmatively takes action to engage with this coalition, the coalition is a little bit more established. How do we plan to reach out to our local congressional delegation and have the conversation with our local congressional delegation? We have two members that we collectively, I think, are covered by. Um, so what's our plan? Because obviously the idea here is let's build support within Congress for this conversation. That conversation uh, amongst the, the coalition members, since we haven't decided to become right. a coalition member, hasn't occurred yet. Okay. So this is the first step. and then. That is certainly the next step, is how do we approach uh, members of Congress, not just ours, but all over the United States, sure. and, and provide that kind of information and support for the situation to change. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, we have had a staff report. There's been a fair amount of discussion. What is the will of this body? All right, we have a motion to approve. We have a second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Thank you. All right, uh, we are at the executive director's report. By chance, did you give it already? I, I think I gave it already. Right. Uh, but uh, I, I'm very pleased to, to hear uh, that um, uh, the support from the board on the information in Dan Walter's column, I think this is a really, I, I, I completely agree that this is a really succinct way of outlining the problem that we are faced with because clearly the state is not interested in any kind of capacity increases that we need for goods movement, for quality of life, for our economic development, for people to just simply get around. It's not just all one thing, as the board is, has clearly uh, indicated. So um, we've got our work cut out for us, but it sounds like we have some uh, allies in the press. All right, great. Thank you. Uh, is there any direction of staff by the board? All right, seeing none, the last item on our agenda is an informational item, so I'd like to ask for a motion to adjourn. Do we have a motion to adjourn? All right, is there a second? Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All right, we're adjourned.